The lion dance has been performed for millennia. It takes rhythm, strength and skill. This is, after all, a martial art to chase evil spirits away. This is one of our very important traditions in China, right? And um, people used to like lion dance during the ceremony. They believe that they can use the lion dance to bring them good luck, good fortune and good healthy. Even in a place like contemporary Hong Kong, such customs remain an influential part of life. We are the Hong Fat Pai in Hong Kong, and we have been over 400 years since we set up here. While these boys embrace a cultural practice which hasn't changed in centuries, 21st century Hong Kong is grappling with its identity. And it's the recent past which is having the greatest effect on the territory. Britain ruled for 156 years, originally through treaties signed during the Opium Wars in the 1800s. Twenty seventeen marks 20 years since the city was handed back from British colonial rule to mainland China. A watershed moment ushered in to much fanfare. The story of this great city is about the years before this night and the years of success that will surely follow it. So has Hong Kong achieved success in the years since reunification? And in a city with such different political perspectives, can it be interpreted in the same way? I went there to find out. It's a city unlike any other in China, governed by the one country, two systems blueprint which means that while Hong Kong is an inalienable part of mainland China, it has the right to a high degree of autonomy and its own mini constitution known as the Basic Law, not found in any other part of China. Pro-Beijing lawmaker Holden Chow says you can easily see the benefits that's brought Hong Kong. I believe the one country, two system principle, generally speaking, it works well. Uh, we have a good economy. Um, even if you look at the rest of the world, uh, we, the rest of the world actually encounters quite a few global economic crises. But uh, in Hong Kong, with the support from the central government, we actually survive these all global economic crises. That kind of backing has kept this financial hub as fierce as ever. The tourism industry is one of the clearest examples of how much Hong Kong now relies on the motherland. Mainland visitors account for more than three quarters of arrivals to the city. And one of the best examples of where to find them is at Ocean Park on Hong Kong Island. One of the star attractions is An An. He was a gift from the central government at the time of handover and has been captivating visitors for almost 20 years. But in this trading centre there are concerns that prioritising finance over political freedoms is forever changing the city's way of life. The one country, two systems model will be in place through to 2047. During that time, the central government, based in Beijing, is meant to have minimal involvement in the running of Hong Kong's affairs. But two decades in, and one of the key promises has yet to be delivered. And that is the right of the people to elect their own leader. And, um, Benny Tai uh, is a local China law professor. So but he's no ordinary it's academic. He was one of the organisers of the Occupy the movement in 2014. Now, again, I have to emphasize that uh, the majority, absolute majority, 
of, of Hong Kong people, including those uh, in the opposition camp, that they accept the sovereignty of China, of, of the communist regime. And, and so we, 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 we are not questioning the authority. And, but, but we just ask for the right to decide our own affairs. And that actually is something promised in the basic law itself. And how can we decide our own affairs, really deciding our own affairs, if our, the political leaders are not elected by Hong Kong people? If Thai represents the old guard of democracy activists, then Nathan Law very much represents the new. At 23 Thank years you. of age, he became the youngest lawmaker ever elected to Hong yeah, Kong's right. Legislative Council as a representative of the pan-democrat group Demosisto. When we spoke to him, he still held that title, but he's since been disqualified for quoting Gandhi and pledging to serve the Hong Kong people at his oath-taking. He is appealing that decision. Since the year 2003, Beijing has been interfering Hong Kong's internal issue very heavily. And it makes us uh, worry that whether one country, two system could still hang on. Especially, uh, we, we haven't got our democracy as promised. So I don't expect we can get democracy easily. But it doesn't mean that we have to give up on striving this, because it is what guarantees Hong Kong people the weight of life and freedom that we used to enjoy. So I think for Hong Kong people, even though we are having a, an uphill battle, and the situation is, is not that good, we still hang on, we still resist. I asked Nathan Law what he would say if he could meet Chinese President Xi Jinping. If I could have a chance to meet him, I won't meet him. Because in Hong Kong, fighting for democracy is not talking to the leadership in Hong Kong. Please give us democracy. But to tell the people that democracy is what you're striving for, and that is what we fight for and shall be united to do it. So for me, as an activist, the target that we communicate is not the authority, but the people. And we hope that we could fight together in such a battleground. Later that day, Nathan, fellow members of Demosisto and other activists would deliver a message for Xi Jinping and the international media ahead of the president's first visit to Hong Kong. They unfurled a banner in Bahinia Square calling for democracy in the territory. Some of the protesters were detained for public nuisance, but they were later released. There's no doubt that the closer ties with the motherland have boosted the economy. Chinese investment has climbed sky high. One effect of the bond, which isn't so easily seen though, is how Chinese influence has shaped local identity. In a small side street in the central district, you can find two of the biggest stars in Cantonese pop music, Denise Ho and Anthony Wong. Somehow, within these few years, all the values and all that, uh, the, 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 the culture that we had, like somehow we realised that it's slipping away from us and it's been taken away from us. Both have been politically active and they say they've paid a price for it. Anyone involved in the entertainment industry who are looking to get into the Chinese, the China market, um, like they, they censor themselves so much that I think it's becoming quite ridiculous because it's not it's not even only about uh, like what do you say in your songs or what do you say in your movies. It's about like who are you friends with. Like who, what concerts do you go to watch? I mean, for me, it, 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 that's what happened after the Umbrella Movement because, like, um, I had a few concerts that, and, and Anthony also, like, we had concerts, and uh, like it was quite obvious that some people who were friends with us, they avoided coming to see the shows. Keep and, a distance. Yeah. <laughs> 
During the Occupy movement in 2014, they released a song called Raise Your Umbrella. The 79-day protest gained worldwide attention as mostly young Hong Kongers took to the streets to call for universal suffrage. Some criticised the protesters for being divisive and bringing parts of the CBD to a standstill. While their calls to vote freely for their chief executive went unanswered, there was no doubt that the governments in Hong Kong and Beijing heard them. I have hopes uh, for the young, the younger generation. They, they have less hang-ups. <laughs> I, I think they, are, they have, they have uh, more courage. And I, I believe in them. I, I think they will, they will, they will fight, fight for Hong Kong. There is perhaps no clearer day to signify the divisions in Hong Kong than July 1st. A date which means reunification to some and a handover to others. In Balhinio Square, the protesters were replaced with politicians. The Chinese and Hong Kong flags waving proudly, side by side and sky high. The president inaugurated the new chief executive, Carrie Lam. For her, the date marked the start of a five-year term to lead Hong Kong under the close direction of Beijing. Across the city, mainlanders had come to celebrate an auspicious day and the milestone which marks the territory's return to the motherland. But for many locals, it's a day of protest, to call attention to issues across the political spectrum, from education to the environment, and to remind the government and the world about the promises made to Hong Kong's people 20 years ago, to have the right to elect their own leader. The city now has 30 years left of the one country, two systems model, one, generation. Sometimes we we are living too long under the black veil that we couldn't remember what our beautiful Hong Kong looks like. But I hope that um, here's a place that anyone could freely express their opinion and we could elect our government and our government would act in alliance with the interests of most of our Hong Kong people and we could still shine as a of the Orient.